Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Marta Bartrigo, currently working as an assistant professor at the IBS International Business School in Budapest. Thank you for being my audience today, and huge thank you for the organizers of this uh, event. This is a really prestigious event, and uh, thank you all. Here is my <coughs> presentation on Chinese presence in Europe and the European Union in the so-called Chinese backyard. My starting point was that the Chinese presence are more visible and tangible in the EU and has a huge impact on the European economy and politics than vice versa. This quite easy statement was formed because of the different usage of power of the two entities. China used more hard power in the European Union and its soft power is only used to mitigate the tension. Meanwhile, the European Union can be seen as a normative power in the Chinese backyard and this value-based foreign policy is not competitive with Beijing's and is not enough to protect the European interest. In order to prove my hypothesis, my agenda is going to follow the next division. Because my research originates from the IR discipline, I try to define what power is and how the literature argues on measuring power. Uh, in the case study, I'm going to analyze the factors of powers regarding China and EU in the other's territory in order to draw my conclusion. According to Daniel Frey, a German Swiss political science expert, if there were a consensus on the concept of power and this measurement, peace would cease to be a problem. Uh, this statement indicates uh, uh, that my research was doomed since day one because the different thinking of the IR school, it's really difficult to name what power is and how to measure it. However, I, I try to do something and give you something new today. I do not want to tell you deeply what kind of thoughts these different IR schools have because I'm totally sure that you are really aware. Here I just want like to emphasize two important regarding my analysis that according to the realist school, uh, power comes from a human nature and this is where the whole problem starts. And on the other hand, how I try to mix that the main deficient on power comes from the um, rally school, uh, I combine it with constructivism. Why with constructivism? Because I think it's not always important to have military power because with other powers of yours, you can win the battle. And on the other hand, how define what power is? What is power? A symbol, yes? And that kind of symbol can only be defined in social interactions. In the foreign policy, it means that through diplomacy. And this is what I would like to combine the research, uh, in my research, that kind of two approach, the realist and the constructivist one. <clears throat> Here comes that according to the literature, there are three phases of power. The first phase, according to Dahl, it means that when you win the argument. The second phase, it means that you have the ability to set an agenda, for example, in an institution. And the third phase is when you have enough cultural or any either ideas or thoughts which can be really convincing the others to do something. From this one, you can, uh, you can already tell that there are different kind of powers. It's easy to say that there is hard power and the other one, the so-called the soft power. Everybody knows the power, this is the oldest form, the hard one. And what does it mean? That you can reach your goal with coercive actions or threat. And what kind of measurements can be used for that? You can see they write to name population, the sites of a country, the territory, geographic or natural resources, besides economic military capabilities. On the other hand, soft power, you can convince the other without the use of force. How? Because the state's foreign policy or culture is really attractive to the others. You have, you leave such a foreign policy where your values, your characters can be used to boost the activities. It's interesting because in 2000s, the literature argues that not only these are the factors of soft power, but they name two new ones, education and business innovation. 
How to measure and analyze power after that? There are two approaches, namely the national power approach, which means that the, the uh, state can control the resources. The relational power approach, they have two aspects, when the control over actors or the control over events or outcomes uh, can, be, uh, <coughs> can be used. After that kind of uh, literature review, which I know it was really, really short, but because I do not have enough time, let me tell you how I conducted my research on my case studies. Uh, I tried to translate this power regarding the EU in the Chinese so-called backyard. You can see Mm, you can see that there are different factors of hard power on the left side of the side and on the uh, right side there are some regarding soft powers. Um, I think hard power is not necessary to define and analyze, but the soft power I think it's more interesting when we're referring that the European Union is a normative power. Why? Because of course it can be seen what is the attractiveness of the European Union. First of all, that the European Union suggests that yes, there is multipolarity in the world and you know, we cannot accept some kind of hegemon in the system. The other one, the European Union is like a mother in the system, some kind of counterbalancing of the US hegemony. But here comes my problem with the European soft power. It's okay that we organize a lot of cultural festivals and with the institution of ASEM we organize some museum network system, but as we could see, we do not have any European cultural institution. What does it mean? That we have Goethe Institution, we have Cervantes Institution, we have British Council in Asia, but as a whole, as a whole European Union, we cannot be presented. What about the political values of the European Union? We have a lot of human rights dialogues, for example, with China as well, or with other uh, Asian countries. Uh, it's really good they learn here, they go to Brussels, they are listening to what is human rights and what does it mean for us. Can we see anything? Not really. The other interesting one regarding political values, the so-called first step for the FTA's regime of the European Union, this is the so-called GSP and above preferential import regimes. They are open for Asian countries who accept some kind of labor rights or human rights and uh, therefore their products can come to the European market easier. There are different uh, institutions uh, not only the ASEM, which is like a forum where they can speak about the non-securital uh, non uh, aspect, but we can mention the RRF, the Asian Regional Forum, which is another dialogue for security aspect, and the so-called TRESESA, which covers the Central Asian region. What about the education in an extra side? We can see that a lot of Chinese students are in the European Union and studying here with us. Altogether, we could say that only 24% of the all foreign students are from China and from that territory. The other programs with the European Union uh, <coughs> uh, lead is the so-called shared programs for the Southeast Asian uh, countries. And tell you the truth, the number last year, 150 students from South Asia studied here in the European Union. What about the business innovations? There are a lot of investors in the European Union. Japan, China, and India is considered to be the new, the emerging ones. Uh, after you are kind of aware what kind of weakness and strengths the European Union can have and power in Asia, uh, here is the, U, uh, the European Union's policy towards Asia. It's named Sustainable, Comprehensive, and Roads-Based Connectivity, the EU's way. What does it mean exactly? They try to boost transport, energy links, the digital networks, and human connection. How with some kind of student exchange programs, or for example, building interregional capabilities like energy transmission. Uh, this energy transmission can be seen, for example, between Central Asia and Southeast Asia. I think this is another uh, tool of the Chinese hard power, which can be named as soft power as well, the so-called free trade agreements regime of the EU. These are the so-called new generation free trade agreements, which you can see on my slide. And it's important to check that there are three Asian countries, 
of course, namely neighboring countries of, the, of China, uh, where the EU has had uh, free trade agreements. These free trade agreements are really successful. If we compare, for example, with the US, the trading goods are more between EU and Asia than between the US and Asia too. And this is also true for the foreign direct investment as well. Hard power of the EU in the Chinese backyard again. I wanted to show you some kind of military aspect because when I speak for my students about hard power, they always expect me to bring some kind of weapon to my lesson. So here is the weapon of the EU. However, as you could see from the geography, the Gulf of Aden is really not exactly what you could consider in the neighbor uh, of China. But uh, the Gulf of Aden is really important geo uh, geopolitically for the Chinese uh, transport system and transport routes. Therefore, I could give you an example how the European Union is presented in the so-called Chinese backyard. This is the Operation Atalanta. Operation Atalanta is kind of successful. It was introduced in 2008, and 2020 is the end of the mission. As you can see, the number of attacks and suspicious events only decreased by the time to time, and nowadays it's nearly, as you could see, the total attacks is only one. However, uh, you could see that in this Operation Atalanta, not only the European Union is there, but Russia too, and on the other hand, the People's Liberation Army Navy, the Chinese uh, Navy, uh, can help uh, with Operation Atalanta as well. But this is the only military aspect which we could say this is a common thing from the European side, because as I checked from the news and from the literature, the states from the European Union would like to deal with China individually. You could see that, for example, Japan has signed defense procurement agreement with France, Germany, Italy, and the UK uh, are uh, already preparing another one. Or if you remember, France just sold a lot of submarines to Australia in December, in December 2016 after Germans sold a lot of submarines to Singapore. Five minutes, okay, fine. So, totally I agree with Manners who said that EU's power is normative power because of its ability to shape international norms in its own image. The EU, like many political actors, has the economic tools and military power, but these are secondary to its ability to shape what passes for normal in international relations and which undoubtedly has utilitarian, social, moral, and narrative dimensions for it. Why? Because as we could see that Europe's recent, recent impact on Asia's political values has been rather limited. However, they try to have su such a dialogue, as we mentioned before. And therefore, I guess the whole normative power could be que questioned. The other one which I agree with Christiansen, that we use not the current actor in Asia, because of the fact bilateral trade relations take presence. It's not a problem, but what we could see here, that here again we cannot refer to the European Union as all, but we can refer to the member states of the EU and what kind of national policy they have towards China or towards Asian countries. And here come the same analysis regarding China, China in the EU. The hard power I do not want to tell you again. Here comes the soft power, which I think is a bit more interesting. Attractive personality, of course, in a political speeches, you can hear that I am a responsible great power and my rising, it's not a threat for everyone. However, that kind of authoritarian regime and how the whole Chinese Communist Party has changed under Xi Jinping, question this fact. What about the culture? From the Chinese side, we can see that there is the Confucius institutions, and in Europe, without the UK now, uh, there are 134. Germany, they have the most, uh, I think, approximately 28. After comes France and Italy. The other one which can be, you know, part of the Chinese culture is the Chinese population in the European Union. Okay, only 3% of the whole 75 millions of international migrants in Europe are from China but it means approximately two and a half million people. So it's more than the population of Budapest. The political values, it's a better topic for tomorrow with the African uh, panel, so I think they are going to argue with that. And here comes the institutions, why are they are important. China is a part and participate in ASEM as well, so they share that kind of interest. The other one, you can see a lot of numbers. 
because these numbers indicate that how China tries to deal with the different regions of the European Union. Uh, the 16 plus one refers to the Central European Initiative, the 7 plus one, the Mediterranean, and the 5 plus one is regarding the Nordic countries and the Chinese cooperation together. And here comes the Belt and Road Initiative and where they built a lot of forum for international cooperation as well. Just to make it short. The Chinese hard power in numbers and what we can see and feel and what is the problem of the European Union is regarding FDI and an acquisition and the so-called divestment. So there are a lot of Chinese investment in the European Union and the problem is that the EU cannot control it. So, so far, they have no regulation against China or any kind of anti-dumping measures like regarding textile they could do. They have nothing. The other problem is not the, the lack of the legal background of that kind of FDI investments, but that China didn't do the same. So, they forbid the foreign investments in 11 sectors. It means that kind of reciprocity is missing from the relations. The other one, the Chinese hard power, just to show you again the weapons, the military, China is kind of active in military diplomatic activities. There were a lot of Chinese military exercises really in the neighborhood of the European Union, like in the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, and the Baltic Sea. There were some kind of common missions with the Egyptian or with the European Union itself as well. Why? Here is the answer, as you agreed before, and this was also the question, that kind of BRI or OBOR initiative, because all of these factors can be seen how they would like to achieve the so-called OBOR. Different approaches for different regions, and I think this is the political challenge that the European Union cannot cope with, and this will be the interesting question for the future. Uh, we have different point of view how they see China and the European Union and others field. According to German foreign minister, if we do not succeed in developing a single strategy towards China, then China will succeed in dividing Europe. From the Chinese perspective, the EU is a regional organization composed of sovereign states, not a sovereign country itself. And here comes my conclusion. So, as we could see, yes, uh, the, my hypothesis has got some proof because Chinese power is stronger uh, in the EU than vice versa and it can cause both political and economic costs for the European Union. Secondly, nowadays soft and hard power have to go hand in hand in order to boost each other. This idea is not new. Since the end of the 90s, Joseph Nye argued that smart power has to be used for reach the foreign activities goal. How? Depending on the situation, on the circumstances. For example, dealing with North Korea and their uh, nuclear program, it's better to use hard power than soft power. Uh, what I miss from smart power and how I wanted to tell you some kind of new today, that I figured out that there is a so-called interconnected power surplus. What is it exactly? That you could see that on the hard power side, the Chinese had some kind of economic strengths. And how this economic strengths is going to be transferred to soft power. Because, in, uh, because of the economic strengths, China builds a lot of institutions, like you could see from the numbers, you could see from the OBOR offices, or from the ASEM. You could see that the overseas Chinese citizens can boost and can go hand in hand with the economic strengths of China, and this goes for the same with the brands. It's interesting because since uh, 2018, if you buy some kind of fridge, and which was made before in Italy, that kind of candy brands, now it belongs to the so-called Chinese one, the higher brands. So, therefore, what I could see here, it's not only enough to combine hard and soft power for different circumstances, but what's the best is to have that kind of interconnected power surplus where you could, you know, transfer your hard power to soft power and therefore mitigate, you know, that kind of tensions coming from any, uh, any other things. And for the European Union, the problem is that that kind of soft and hard power, which I use this term interconnected power surplus, cannot be seen because they cannot transform their hard power to soft power, and they cannot transform their soft power to hard power either. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs>